At year end, Manson's group attended a party at a trippy, off-kilter house in Topanga Canyon, known as the Spiral Staircase. Charlie then convinced the owner, a woman named Gina, to let them stay. Gina knew the house would soon be condemned, and she agreed to let them squat there for a time. Gina may have been Georgina Brayton. Brayton was a leader at the Solar Lodge, a secret society formed in 1965, inspired by Aleister Crowley. The lodge eventually disbanded after allegations in the 70s of child abuse and ritualistic torture. In Manson's biography, as told to a former fellow inmate, he claims the owner was pumped up about devil worship and other satanic activities. That New Year's Eve, in fact, there were reportedly a number of known Satanists partying at the spiral staircase along with Manson and the women. The spiral staircase was a Dutch colonial revival built just before 1900 and possibly owned by tycoon William Randolph Hearst. Hearst did own the nearby motel court where friends during Prohibition would stay after a late night of imbibing. The spiral staircase, in its long history, was used for a time as a dance hall and speakeasy. But by late 1967, the starlets and speculators had come and gone, and the house had faded in its glory. In fact, only the second floor was livable by the time Manson and his group discovered it. The house was built in a flood basin, and after a series of rainstorms, became unmoored from its foundation. A creek actually ran through the house, and the first floor was uninhabitable, filled with sand. Brayton was likely only a tenant in the house and not the owner, but the spiral staircase was known by police as a local hangout and possible drug den. For years, a well-known photograph of the psychedelic band Love was believed to be shot at the spiral staircase, but more likely that photo was taken at another spiral staircase house in Hollywood, one formerly owned by horror film star Bella Lugosi. The Topanga Beach home notably had its spiral staircase outside, and in the rear of the property. Manson and the women initially stayed at the home, but within the black bus. Once, they woke to police dogs sniffing around looking for narcotics. Eventually, they moved into the house, settling in on the second floor. At that time, Susan placed a call to Ella Jo, telling her to come join them. Ella Jo then hitched a ride to L.A., Ella Jo Bailey was born January 1, 1947, in Holland, Michigan. With blonde, curly hair and a shy, enigmatic smile, she bore a passing resemblance to Greta Garbo. Ella Jo would never be one of the most devout, <clears throat> crazy, family members, but she was with the group for the next year and a half. Unwittingly, she also inspired the family's first killing. Charlie met a young musician in January of 68. Robert Bobby Beausoleil, 23, was raised in Santa Barbara, the youngest of five children. Bobby was a self-taught musician who moved to Los Angeles as a teen. He and Arthur Lee, of the aforementioned band Love, formed a music act, The Grassroots, and it is rumored that Love, Lee's next band, was named for Bobby, a.k.a. Cupid. Bobby already earned that nickname before he met Manson and the women. In 67, Bobby moved to San Francisco and got involved with filmmaker Kenneth Anger. Their cinematic collaboration fell apart during filming of Lucifer Rising. Bobby played the lead role and took over soundtrack duties from Led Zeppelin guitarist Jimmy Page, who stepped down to focus on other priorities. Beausoleil was alleged to have absconded with the film score on his way out of the bay. He fled back to Southern California and began a series of musical, and personal meanderings. He met Manson at the spiral staircase while attempting to break into Hollywood's film industry. The first time I met the Manson people was at the spiral staircase, Bobby recalled. There was a party going on, people smoking pot and playing music. I sat down, I listened for a while, and I picked up this thing called a melodica. I picked it up and started improvising some counterpart melodies, which kind of blew everyone's mind. Maybe they were all loaded on acid. Bobby was mercurial, mischievous, and gorgeous. 
He had many admirers, women and men alike. Bobby Beausoleil was never an official Manson family member until perhaps summer of 1969, and his friendship with Charlie didn't begin as competition, but maybe it ended as such. Bobby later acknowledged that he was molested at age 13 by an older man. Bruce Davis was also the victim of a sexual predator as a boy. It made both of them susceptible to the manipulations of a more experienced, more forceful man like Manson. Davis later told a parole board why he was drawn to someone like Charlie. Attraction to what I saw as a powerful, talented person. A man. Bobby was known as an eccentric dude, sometimes walking around Los Angeles with a falcon on his shoulder. The night they met, Bobby began bragging to Charlie about his music connections, including Frank Zappa. Beausoleil wasn't into tethering himself to a guru, but he did want to play music with Manson. A few days later, Charlie dropped in on Bobby, who was staying in Topanga with a fellow musician and chemist named Gary Hinman at a comfy two-story hillside house. Gary was welcoming, mild-mannered, and warm-hearted. According to members of the family, Hinman was gay and may have been attracted to Bobby. But because he was shy, he was reticent to act on his feelings. So he simply became a dutiful friend, welcoming Bobby anytime he needed a place to stay. Later, his generosity extended to others in the family. Charlie met Hinman and dug him quite a bit. Gary was a versatile musician, Maybe he had industry contacts, Charlie surmised. Manson liked him and even more when he learned the chemist sometimes made speed in his basement. Plus, he had two cars and was willing to loan them to good friends. Charlie made sure that Gary knew that he considered him a very dear friend. He also encouraged Mary and Sadie to cozy up to him in as much as possible. That winter, at a party at the spiral staircase, Lynn looked into a room full of people and spied a familiar face. It's Diane, she shouted. Charlie and the women warmly greeted Diane Lake, daughter of the couple from the Hog Farm. Diane, born December of 53 in Minnesota, joined her parents and siblings as they ventured west two years earlier. Her parents each sought enlightenment, but the Lakes eventually wound up living in a bread van before moving to Hog Farm. Diane was molested as a child and very developed physically, often attracting the attention of older men. In fact, she got booted from the hog farm for having sex with adults, which might have put Wavy Gravy into legal jeopardy. Diane's parents agreed to let her work for a Los Angeles couple as an au pair, and coincidentally, she stayed with that family in the fall of 67 at the spiral staircase. Now 14 years old and living with another couple in a polyamorous situation, she'd been in and out of communes and group sex situations for a year. Her parents had signed a letter effectively emancipating the teen, should she ever be questioned by police. Diane wrote a 2017 memoir about her life in the family, the youngest of Charlie's followers. In it, she described her first meeting with Manson. Charlie stood up and looked into my eyes so deeply and intimately that I almost turned away on instinct. Instead, I held his gaze and felt like he was looking into me. So this is our Diane he said, and pulled me to his chest in a hug so close I could feel his heartbeat. He held on for several seconds. I was used to the hippie hugs at the hog farm, but this felt warm and real. Tears welled up into my eyes as I took in his embrace. Charlie held me at arm's length, looked at me, and said, Oh, you're beautiful. I want to talk to you. I've been looking for you. The women noted how juvenile Diane was, not just in age, but demeanor. She'd become a plaything for adults, with tastes bordering on perversion, lost and voiceless in a world of debauchery. She brought out the maternal instincts in Charlie's gals, except, initially, Lynette. Charlie knew that I was jealous of Diane, Fromay wrote. He finally stopped, looked me in the eyes, smiled, embraced me, shrugged, and said, She's your sister. In that context, we women were a sisterhood and Diane had become one of us. As Diane wrote, I had only my initial impressions of these women who would become my closest friends. I knew few facts about them. 
I would piece together the stories of these women gradually, as I became more familiar with each of them. It wasn't until years later, when I finally compared all the accounts of how each of us met Charlie, that I realized how similar all our stories were, perhaps with the exception of Susan. We'd all been isolated from our families and struggled to find out where we belonged. Diane particularly enjoyed Ella Jo. She often faded into the background, but we shared a love of nature and quiet and often took walks together. Ella Jo Bailey appeared shy, but it was probably because she was overshadowed by Susan's big personality. She was a curly-haired blonde with a gentle smile and just a bit of sarcasm in her expression. Her blue eyes twinkled as she amused herself with observations she was too shy to share with the group. Although she stayed on the periphery of things, I enjoyed her playfulness and her open heart.